Hi, I'm David Scranton from The Income Generation. And today's topic is about diversification. How important is it? Is it good? Is it bad? You know, you hear both sides of the story. Some people say you have to diversify, right? In fact, financial advisors are taught rule number one is you have to diversify your holdings uh, to reduce risk. And I'll talk about why we as financial advisors are taught that. But sometimes you listen to people who are quite affluent and they say that they didn't diversify. They put all the rigs in one basket. In fact, some people say if you diversify, let's say in the stock market, well, you're just going to track the stock market. If you're going to diversify, you might as well buy an S&P 500 fund. So what's the real truth here about diversification? Is it good? Is it bad? How important is it? Well, in part, it depends upon the purpose of the money uh, that you're looking at. Number two, it's got to do with um, you know, how risky the investments are that you're in. If you're in investments that are guaranteed, let's say you're in U.S. Treasuries and you have enough money where you can get a 1% or 2% return, well, they don't really need to diversify because it's U.S. Treasuries. It's pretty safe. So as a general rule, the riskier the investment, the more you need to diversify. But you know, also, as a general rule, if it's money you need or money you just want, that makes a difference too. So for example, if I have money that I want but don't need, and I want to speculate and put it all in Bitcoin, right? and I'm just using Bitcoin as an example, I'm not recommending that, I can do that. In fact, I have a friend that took some money earlier on, I want to say 2013 or 14 in Bitcoin, didn't have a lot in it, and now has over a million dollars. But it's play money for him. If he loses it all, it's not a big deal. It's not part of his retirement money. In which case, that kind of speculate, speculation can work. But if it was part of his retirement money, then it would be completely imprudent for him to do something like that. So, and you talk about a lot of people who've made their wealth, right? How did Bill Gates make his wealth? Well, he made it through Microsoft. Uh, you know, Steve Jobs, and he's alive, made it through Apple stock. Uh, you know, Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway. Now you could say Berkshire Hathaway is diversified, but still his, his was from owning that stock. You know, Sam Walton, Walmart. So a lot of people have become very wealthy by not diversifying, having all the rigs in one basket. But remember, that's not an investment. That's somebody who, it's their business. They ran it, they controlled it. And it's important to understand that when you're talking about passive investments, whether they're stocks or bonds or bond-like instruments, or whether it's something like Bitcoin or gold, you can't control the price of that. At least if it's your own business, you can have some control over the outcome. And personally, I'm an advocate as a business owner of not spreading myself too thin. So if you're entrepreneurial, you're a business owner, I recommend don't start 10 businesses, get really good at one thing, and if that becomes self-sufficient, then maybe you could try something else. In that regard, yeah, you can be really have all your eggs in one basket. But again, that's not an investment, that's a business that you own. So why is it then that people are taught, and we as financial advisors are taught to diversify if you're gonna be in the financial markets? Well, it's really simple. Because there's two types of risk, non-diversifiable risk and diversifiable risk. And if you were to take a look at a graph of the two, you'd see that the non-diversifiable risk is risk that you have for being an investment. Let's take the stock market as an example. Okay? Uh, if you are in the S&P 500 index fund, you own little bits and shares of 500 different stocks, essentially our Fortune 500 companies. You're diversified in the stock market. So you've eliminated some risk, right? Because as opposed to owning the S&P 500, I could pick one of the 500 stocks and put all my money in that. And it can quadruple in a year or it can go bankrupt and go to zero. Okay? So by being in the S&P 500, I've eliminated that risk. That's called diversifiable risk. It's the risk that one particular company could have a bad outcome, uh, could have something happen to them, fall out of favor and have the stock go bankrupt or drop significantly in value. But if I own the S&P 500, the Fortune 500 companies, I have not eliminated the non-diversifiable risk, right? Because you don't need me to tell you that even if you're diversified in the stock market, sometimes it goes up and all the boats rise when the tide comes in, and sometimes the tide goes out and all the boats fall. And we saw that in 2000 when the tech bubble burst. It almost didn't matter 
what type of stock you own, large cap, small cap, domestic, foreign growth or value, they all dropped. Same happened in 2008 with the financial crisis. Same happened in March of 2020 at the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, right? So that's a non-diversifiable risk. That's what you have when you're in the stock market. But the assumption there is that unless our financial markets totally fail, you're not going to lose all your money. You're just going to deal with volatility. Okay? So think of that non-diversifiable risk. They call it good risk because that's risk that's going to create volatility in your portfolio. But the general rule is the more of that non-diversifiable risk that you take, the more you're going to get paid for taking, the more return you're going to get. Okay? And that's where when you say more risk, more return. But again, that risk doesn't mean putting all your money in Bitcoin necessarily, because now you're dealing with diversifiable risk because you have too much, too many eggs in one basket. And that diversifiable risk is something that you may or may not get paid for. You don't know it's a gamble. So think of the non-diversifiable risk of being in the stock market, but being diversified as an example, uh, or being in commodities, but being diversified. That's a non you know, that, that's a, a non-diversifiable risk. That's a risk that you should get paid for taking over time. But a diversifiable risk, having too much of one commodity, too much of one stock, uh, that's something that you typically may or may not get paid for. It's a total gamble. So if you're gonna gamble on the something that might fund an I want, not an I need, well, that's okay, right? So if I say, uh, I wanna buy a bigger boat, I love my 26-foot center console. It's great, but I was out in six-footers the other day fishing, and you know I really would like a 35-foot boat. Okay, that's wonderful. That's something I can take. I could take diversifiable risk. I can gamble. I can pick a company I think is really going to do well. Put a lot of money in there. Pick a cryptocurrency I think is really going to do well. Commodity. Put my money in one. And you know what? If it if it does really well, hey, I can upgrade my boat. If it doesn't. Well, you know what? I'm not going to die if I have a 26-foot boat. It's still more boat than most people have. I'm still doing fine, right? But on the other hand, if it's my retirement goals or my goals for my, college, my kids' college education or something that's important, now I want to eliminate that, that diversifiable risk. And now I want to manage my non-diversifiable risk based upon my risk tolerance and my time horizon. And again, that non-diversifiable risk has to do with what class of assets you're in. So do I want to be diversified in the bond market? Do I want to be diversified in the commodities market, in the real estate market, in the stock market? See, as long as I'm diversified, I've gotten rid of the bad risk, the diversifiable risk, and I'm left with the good risk, the non-diversifiable risk. Okay, but I judge that, and I can manage my own volatility, the degree to which my investments should fluctuate based upon my time horizon, my goals, and so on, once I'm diversified. So... I hope this helps give you a little bit of an answer as to whether diversification is good or bad and where you want to diversify and where you don't. Uh, if you have any questions on this, I know it's a complex topic, feel free to reach out to us uh, and we'll be happy to answer any of your questions. But meanwhile, if you like what you heard and this makes some sense to you, go ahead and give us a thumbs up to let us know you like us. And again, remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you could see videos like this periodically about various topics that might just be of interest to you. Thanks for watching.